Okay, Beth, you may start. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Beth Radow. I chair the uh, New York State League's Committee on Energy, Agriculture, and the Environment. Thank you for joining Kay Wagner, who's the co-president of the Tompkins County League and a member of our committee, and me for this workshop, which we're calling Carbon's Bigfoot and You. After Kay and I speak, we will open up to questions from you uh, from the chat box or raising questions, uh, raising your hand, and maybe Kay will have the technical um, expertise on that uh, more than me or will refer to uh, Kathy Meany to help. So the, the topic tonight is, is climate change, and we are well aware of the challenges presented by a warming climate. Extreme weather impacts to our food supply, health effects, damaged infrastructure, accelerated migration patterns, and so much more. And on a policy level, assuming all goes as planned, at the convention, uh, delegates will vote to call upon the board and local leagues to urge state um, board and the local leagues to urge state and local governments to adopt and publicize declarations of climate emergency that are responsive to local conditions and to take Beth, you're muted. Beth, you're muted. You muted yourself, Beth. There you go. About uh, 20 of those here tonight have signed up for the Saturday workshop with Kathy Stein and me, and we will be able What's to talk more about We'll be able to talk more about the climate emergency on uh, Saturday. Saturday. If anybody wants to sign up who hasn't, please uh, join us then. We'd, we'd love to talk to you about that at that time. Tonight, we're taking a more personal look at the impacts of climate change by covering topics that bear on our daily lives, both as individuals and as community residents. While we can't cover all the topics tonight, our goal with the handout sent to you earlier was to touch on the various aspects of our daily lives that have an impact on or are impacted by climate change. And there is excellent resource material in the handout that you can link to. Um, and uh, if you would like to share with us any resources that you have, my email address is at the bottom of the handout, so please write to me. Our goal tonight is to share a few examples that we're aware of that demonstrate just how taking the next step can create momentum, leading to new habits, new perspective, and effective change. And while climate change is a global condition, our focus here is on acting locally. At our last convention, uh, to those who were able to uh, attend the uh, workshop that I led, I discussed food. And I'm going to pick up on food again tonight. First of all, it's one of my favorite topics, and, and also because food has a direct relevance to our impact as individuals on climate change. To recap, if uh, food production and wasted food were a country, it would be the third largest contributor to global warming behind China and the United States. 40% of the food we grow across the food chain never gets eaten. And yet one in nine New Yorkers and one in every seven New York children is food insecure. An important component of reducing wasted food involves redirecting nourishing food that might otherwise not be eaten to people in need of food. And there's good news on that front. While I was preparing for tonight, uh, I came across uh, a new piece of legislation we corrected our course for the better from the food challenges New York faced during COVID-19. Uh, the New York legislature has made permanent in law a practice initiated during COVID-19 that diverts excess food from our farms to our food pantries. And as I said, I just came across the, uh, the law and I will make that link available after uh, tonight's event for anyone who's interested. So the, st the law is a step in the right direction for el eliminating uh, wasted food.
that's further up the food chain. But there are steps that we can take at the local level. Um, Today, I'll give an example of what you can do to make the most of food at home and in your community. And since I saw you last, I participated in obtaining a grant from the New York State Department of uh, Department of Environmental Conservation for the benefit of the town of Mamaroneck to develop an educational campaign in the schools and Larchmont Mamaroneck community at large around reducing the amount of food we waste. We call our campaign Love Your Food, and our mantra is eat, share, and compost the rest. The goal around the grant in our, in our schools has been to educate our students to recycle food scraps in the cafeteria, and this was obviously before COVID, um, and we're picking up uh, once students are full-time back in school, safely sharing unopened food, participating in a school garden, learning about the link between climate change and our food supply, and bringing home the practices and information that the students learn in school. On the community level, I co-developed the Love Your Food website with the expertise of consultants paid for by the grant. And I've included the link to the Love Your Food website on the handout uh, to this program. We designed it to be upbeat. It has lots of practical tips and strategies to make the most of what you purchase. And we created it with a local focus, but it can be of benefit to all here, regardless of where you live. And under a section on the homepage called Food for Thought, we wanted to have a hyper-local focus. We share stories that we've collected and we we post quarterly. Um, The goings on around town by students and others in the community that relate to our food topic. So, for example, there is one high school student who's a senior. She's taking film class. She's an aspiring documentary filmmaker. We spent time on the phone together. This is a topic of interest to her, and she's produced two short films. Other students have gotten involved with composting. Still others are inspired to find ways to collect and share food with people in our community in need of food. The value of reading these posts on the Food for Thought section um, of the homepage of the Love Your Food website is that you may see something that we're doing that you are inspired by and that you might want to replicate as a model in your community. So I encourage you to check out the Food for Thought section. And we've now had this grant going for about a year and a half, and we were on a hiatus during COVID-19, but people rallied in the best ways that that they could. And I think this particular grant and this project uh, speaks volumes about how a community can rally around a topic as important as this one. In addition, our community developed a municipal food scrap recycling program four years ago, which has grown steadily. And our ultimate goal is to initiate curbside pickup of the food scraps. Now our residents have to drop off the food scraps at our local um, DPW, where they are then transported to a composting site. That, another example of student engagement involves stu- enterprising students who will pick up and drop off the food scraps for local residents who cannot get to our DPW easily. So anecdotally, I started to treat um, our home food supply differently once I started separating my food scraps from the trash. I became much more aware of what was getting tossed, and now I find ways to use more and toss less. And I also ended up with very little trash, plastic wrappers from food packaging, and that was pretty much it. So in my town, I am a member of our sustainability collaborative, and we've been working for years to figure out the most efficient way to tackle our sanitation, because that also has a bearing um, on, on climate change. We happen to burn our trash in Westchester County. Um, Some of you may live in jurisdictions where your trash goes to landfills. And in either example, those are contributors to climate change. Now, in our municipal trash pickup, we uh, have pickup twice a week. 
But when people start separating their food scraps and recycling their food scraps separately, we start to discover that you can't justify trash pickup twice a week. Um, you really only need it once a week. And so the goal would be when we have a critical mass of residents who are separating their food scraps, that we can pick to pick up uh, trash one day a week and shift um, over to picking up the food scraps the second day. Making food scrap pickup more accessible by food, um, by, the, by the curbside pickup will reduce the barriers to this uh, social norm, which we're trying to, to, trying to establish. And I think what we've discovered in, in these projects is that the fewer barriers, the better. That concept applies across the board to anybody who's trying to figure out how to transform habits that we have into norms that are more climate friendly. So the long-term sanitation goal in our community is to provide for pay as you throw, which makes each resident accountable for their own trash um, and by paying for the bags. So getting to pay as you throw involves this step-by-step -step process and we know that that's going to take time. But in Westchester County, we're making progress, um, particularly now that our county executive, George Latimer has equalized the local sanitation pickup fees for municipal trash and food scraps. Shifting back to food insecurity, during COVID, the number of food insecure families in the large Montmorency community doubled, according to the president of our local food pantry, as did the number of older adults in need of receiving delivery of food from our food pantry. Out of concern for possible contamination, our local food pantry uh, discontinued acceptance of food donations, opting instead for money donations to purchase food from established sources. So with necessity being the mother of invention and lots of time indoors to contemplate, a couple of my ideas turned into new practices. These days when I shop uh, for food, I gravitate to the day old produce shelf at our stop and shop to select for a fraction of the retail price, perfectly good fresh food that may have a ding or two, but then at the checkout counter, I donate the savings to our food pantry. Check with the grocery manager at your local market to establish an option to add dollars to the bill at your checkout counter. Um, that could go directly to your local food pantry. On a cumulative basis, when we each gross up an extra 50 cents to the next dollar or give an extra dollar, it adds up. And if your supermarket won't go for it, you can take the savings and write a, write a check directly to your local food pantry um, from the money you save on the day-old shelf. And those day-old shelves increasingly are also including the cakes and, um, and bread. And I even see that when the, the chicken is getting near the date when it's got to be sold, they slash those prices too. And the food is still perfectly good. Uh, it just costs less money. So I look at it this way, I'm saving food from the, from the dumper and I'm doing a bit to help uh, a neighbor in need and overall it feels pretty good. Another example is um, I rent a, a 10 by four uh, raised bed at a community garden in Nourishell. And last summer during COVID-19, I was lucky enough to grow a bumper crop of tomatoes, which I donated to our food pantry. And that felt pretty pr terrific too. Through the Love Your Food website, we encouraged local families to farm their backyards and donate produce to our local food pantry for the benefit of their clients. This same idea caught on in a big way last summer with a community resident who established Victory Farms, which will continue this summer to coordinate with local residents, schools, and houses of worship who grow their own produce to make donations to the Larch Montmorency Hunger Task Force for the benefit of its clients. Connected to the Victory Farms is the Victory Arms, a young brigade of able-bodied teens who helped last summer restore our community's nature center garden beds. And these teens will be available through Victory Farms to work on this summer's garden projects. 
So that's a snapshot of how we have used a government grant to educate and inspire local engagement to make the most of our food and reduce our carbon footprint. And you will see a link to the food print on the handout. Check it out. I know the folks that put that together and they do excellent work. Our handout has steps that you can take to find out what works for you. So please uh, do visit. One more thing um, before I turn this over to Kay, as indicated in the handout, New York's f food donation and food scraps recycling law will go into effect on January 1, 2022. And it requires um, businesses such as our supermarkets and institutions such as our colleges and prisons that generate an annual average of two tons or more of wasted food a week to donate excess edible food and recycle all remaining food scraps if they are within 25 miles of an organic recycler or composting facility. So this new law at a more global level in New York State should help us reduce the amount of food that we waste. Thanks for listening, and I'm going to turn this over to Kay to take it away. Hi. So somehow we're viewing Lynn Levine's screen. Yes, Lynn, would you please stop sharing your screen, Lynn Levine? Somehow you hit the share screen button. I know. I don't know what happened. Okay. Would you kindly right. stop sharing? I don't. I'm looking to see how I can undo this. You have reached 539 Please leave a message after the tone. Okay, would somebody mute their phone, please, unless it's Kay? So what's happening? Hey, Lynn, I'm going to ask you to log off and log back in. I'm going to, I'm going to try to log off, yes. Thank you. OK. OK, Kay, you can get started. OK. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm Kay Wagner, and I'm co-president of the League from Tompkins County and also chair the natural resources or co-chair the natural resources committee with Susan Malter. And um, what I want to really think about today is uh, getting you to appreciate the importance of acting locally. And so this is sort of carrying on from the kinds of things that Beth was talking about with regard to food. And um, so uh, just to, to tell you a, a little bit about where I come from, uh, to put things in context, um, I'm lucky. Uh, I come from a county that's blessed with the resources of two colleges and a university, plus a large number of wise and energetic individuals who care about our climate and our environment. The resources include Cornell University and Ithaca College, with the many faculty experts who contribute to our local efforts. And also it includes Cornell's Cooperative Extension, which helps to educate farmers and gardeners about regenerative farming techniques. Um, for those of you who attended the uh, caucus that we did two years ago, you may remember that I talked about carbon farming and the whole issue of trying to do farming the right way so that you sequester carbon. And the uh, Cooperative Extension also supports uh, putting uh, starting farmers markets throughout uh, New York State. I know I've seen some up in the outer round decks that they've been helped get started. Um, so this caucus has a goal of see, helping you to see how you can make a difference uh, personally when it comes to climate change. And it, just to share my own thinking, I used to think that the actions of the federal government were the key to making things happen. But uh, in our fight to brand, ban fracking, many of us discovered how powerful we can be and how much leverage we can have when we act locally. Um, so our handout gives you some ideas of the way we can reduce pollution in our personal lives. And Beth was talking about more of that. Um, I want to talk about one step up, meaning working with our local towns, cities, and counties to make a difference as the kind of thing Beth was talking about. 
So I want to give you two quick examples and then follow it by looking at a little more depth of two examples which might give uh, form some models for things you might be interested in. Um, so first of all, uh, to carry on with best discussion of food insecurity, our own local um, organization called Friendship Donations um, right now is, is currently receiving over 1,500 pounds of food each day that's contributed by the local grocery stores. So these local grocery stores have this day old food that then they're contributing directly to the Friendship Donation Center, which then um, makes sure it gets to people in need. And now this is just a very local effort. It was started by one person and I ran into her the other day and she's in her mid to late eighties and is still actively helping to run this organization. So wonderful work on her part. The other thing I wanna mention uh, first is um, I live in the town of Dryden and this is basically a rural town, but it was one of the two first towns in New York state to ban fracking. And the way this happened was that a group of residents got this started with the help of two local lawyers and going door to door to visit people and get them to sign petitions and so on. The first step involved getting it passed by the town board. And eventually the legal case ended up at the highest courts in New York state and we won thanks to the help of Earth Justice. So what started with a small local group has ended up in the long run with a statewide ban. And it took the effort of many residents testifying at town, the town legislature and the planning board meetings, or at least just showing up. Nothing one person could do alone. Okay, now I wanna just uh, give a couple examples of things that might work for models, give you some new ideas of things that you can be doing. And the first is the Finger Lakes Climate Fund, and you'll find a link for that in the handout. Uh, this activity was formed under the umbrella of the org organization of Su Sustainable Tompkins. And the goal of this fund is to help those in our community who are in lower income brackets and want to help, get, help getting their homes insulated or even in a few cases, assist assistance in installing heat pumps. And so this is the way it works. I'll give you sort of an example if I'm using it. it. When I travel locally around town or I take a trip, I can go to the website. Um, and as I said, the website is, there's a link in the handout and have it, the system calculate my carbon offsets. Um, I can do it by either by saying I use my car or I took an airplane, I can buy mileage or my starting and ending points. Um, and the software will tell me how much I should contribute to the fund. And I can tr contribute more or less, but um, it is basically calculating, uh, according to the carbon that was emitted by the, my activities, what I should be contributing. And I can also go in and have it calculate offset, offsets for the energy I use in my home. Now, what happens with the contributions? These contributions then go to this fund that assists others in making their homes more comfortable and more energy efficient. And in the process, it usually also lowers their utility bills. Uh, the fund has raised, on the website the other day, it said it has raised $33,983 since uh, January of 2020. Um, and this actually seems to me to be an exceptional number because most of us weren't doing any traveling. So people who otherwise might have gone on the system and calculated what their trip had, had um, cost in a sense, um, just weren't traveling and weren't doing it. So I wouldn't be surprised as, if as people start traveling more and as they're getting more publicity out about the fund, if this money uh, doesn't go up uh, significantly. Um, okay, now the second model I want to talk about is to describe the new green building regulations that have just been adopted by the city of Ithaca and are likely to soon be adopted by the town of Ithaca. Uh, this is a set of guidelines that is not only meets New York State code, but it's stronger even than the New York State stretch code, if you're familiar with that. 
And here are just some of the main points. If you actually look at the full regulation, it's very detailed, very complicated. So I'm just gonna give you some of the high points. Um, first of all, it applies to all new construction for residential and commercial buildings, and also to major renovations of existing buildings. Effective August 4 of this year, all new buildings will be constructed to produce 40% fewer uh, greenhouse gas emissions than those built according to New York State code. By January 23, the code will require building designs to, to achieve not a 40%, but an 80% reductions in emissions compared to the New York State code. And then when we, uh, this next date is something that had been further out in the future, but we put pressure on and they moved it sooner. And in January 2026, new buildings will be required to be net zero for energy by using a combination of renewable energy and very near carbon free energy for heating and cooling. No fossil fuels can be used except for cooking and process energy. Uh, that means like manufacturing labs, things like this. And we hope that most of the cooking um, will also be electric um, and then have that getting them getting their energy from solar farms, which we have a lot of local solar farms. Um, <clears throat> but restaurants sometimes really want to be using uh, gas uh, for cooking. Um, I was just looking at the website for this earlier today, and I one interesting thing that they pointed out that this uh, the supplement code supplement is giving. They mentioned that there's an emphasis on the issue of social justice, and that they're hoping that this will result in more affordable buildings, uh, because actually for a lot of the installations, it's less expensive than the old fashioned stuff, and uh, with lower energy costs for the residents of the buildings. Uh, now, earlier on, we were trying to put pressure on the developers by using, um, trying to get point systems on tax abatements, and I don't know if that's still going to be in the picture, but <clears throat> for instance, I could imagine giving tax abatements when um, some restaurant decides, well, we're going to do induction cooking instead of using natural gas or even standard electric cooking. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what might happen in that front. Now, all of this wouldn't have happened if it had not been, again, for a group of energetic and persistent community members. So it didn't just sort of start with the city council. Um, it also included a lot of us who just went and testified as individuals at the city council and at the planning board sessions. Uh, now, this was so important, important, in fact, that the mayor, um, who's actually made a reput reputation for himself, you may have seen him in the, the media, Savanti Myrick, uh, he once thanked a, a resident for putting pressure on him. He said that it woke him up to the importance of the issues involved and also helped him put pressure on others. And he told Joe to keep it up um, and not let up the pressure. Now, a couple of key notes that I want to make here. Uh, first, we discovered that many of our planning boards and planning departments had never needed to think about issues around greenhouse gases and saving energy. And so we really need to spend time educating them. And so, and we're continuing that process at all of the local planning meetings. We're often going and basically trying to educate the planning boards as to why it's important and what are the kinds of things that can be done and what you need to pay attention to because traditionally these planning boards have often just paid attention to how far should a building be from the curb and how should the high should the hedges be. And this is something totally different for them. The second thing I wanna really emphasize is that um, it's important to go out and testify at all these kinds of meetings. Doesn't matter how shy you are, you can just say a few sentences, sometimes even just your presence. You can hand them something in writing and then just be there physically. Um, if you find that you can testify on the behalf of your local league, then by all means do it. And occasionally I do. But I know I often find that either the time constraints are too tight for me to get board permission to do it, or um, 
the exact nature of what I want to say isn't completely in, in league guidelines. In other words, they, there may not be a, a league position yet that's quite appropriate. Um, I just go and I testify as a resident and that's just as powerful. But when you can do it as a league member, it's great. So start showing up. Um, you look at some of these models that I, I just mentioned and start thinking about what you can do in your community and what are the things that are needed in your community. Okay. Thank you, Kay. I, I think what we'd like to do uh, is see if anybody's got any questions that they'd like, uh, anything they'd like to offer, and maybe we can start a conversation. I'm not 100% sure how that works on Zoom, but we'll figure it out. Lori uh, Dawson, a documentary on regenerative agriculture streaming, Kiss the Ground. I don't know, did we, uh, did we include that, uh, Kay, in our, in our handout? I'm not yes. sure. Yes. Yeah, we included it. It, I included the book and mentioned that it's also a film now. Thank you, Lori. Appreciate it. And Beth, um, let me see, is it Arlene? Somebody had their hand up. Okay, I, let's see. I just missed it. Can, can Arlene unmute? I, I don't, um, let me see. Ann has her hand up. Ann has her hand up. Ann Erling. Oh, that's who it was. She disappeared from my screen. There you are, Ann. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, uh, I'm excited about the Finger Lakes Climate Fund. I have a couple of points, but one is that. Um, is it, I'm, I'm assuming that's, uh, I looked at it briefly from your, your hand up earlier today, and I'm assuming that's local fund. And I'm wondering, is it possible to get the, I don't know, is it possible to get the programming language or whatever from that to be able to create our own local version? Yeah, it's, yeah it's a complicated process. And um, uh, I, I did get, so, I sort of uh, emailed uh, Gay Nicholson, who's the uh, head of uh, Sustainable Tompkins. And um, I've got an email from her somewhere uh, about it. Um, why don't you send me your email with the question and I'll get it to you. My email's on the handout. Okay. Yes. That sounds good. And then I also wanted to share well with you and with everybody, um, a local group in the Capital District has been putting together a, um, guide for municipal municipalities um, actions that municipalities can take and there's a there's an initial version of it that has been put out and um, and then uh, we're working on an, on an updated version that will eventually be in a dedicated website but I'll put the link to the document um, in the chat, uh, uh, and, and that's a that's a good thing to bring to your local uh, municipal or county uh, uh, leaders. If you would also email it, possibly when you email Kay, that would be uh, that would be appreciated. Sure. Thank you so much. What is in the guide? Uh, Let's see here, I'm trying to get to my screen. Uh, let's see, it's a roadmap for a sustainable future. So there are um, uh, categories related to electrification, clean energy, energy efficiency, carbon sequestration, uh, buildings, transport, there, it, it's, um, it's, there's a grid on, uh, one of the pages with hyperlinks to sections of the of the uh, document. Uh, for example, on um, adopting string, stringent energy codes, and then there will be a section in the document that talks about that. Uh, and um, 
these are all things that a municipality would have the authority to do. So there's, you know, we're working on, um, I wasn't uh, involved in putting together this initial portion, but we're um, looking for, we're scouring the, uh, what other municipalities across the country have done, what other kinds of ideas there are to add to this roadmap. So yeah, if I, if I can share it, and if other people have ideas, send them my way. <laughs> What we can do when this is over is we'll compile any information that goes in the chats. C Kathy, I'm assuming that we can get the uh, websites that people are putting in chat boxes and I can convert them into an email that I can circulate to everybody uh, who's attending tonight. Yes. I'll and and that way I'll we can share the information. Is that, does that work? Yeah, I'll save the chat for you and I'll email it to you. Yep. Thank you. Okay, Thank I, you. See that, I see Marlene yeah. has a question too. Yeah, can I, can I just say, add one thing to that one thought? We've had at least one person who says that they joined after we, uh, they signed up for this after we sent the handout out. So if we could send the handout again to everyone. We'll get the names of people. We'll have to compare the lists and I'll fit, we'll figure it out. Thank you for letting me know that. Okay. Okay, I, I know Eileen, you got your hand up, but Marlene was first, so we'll go to Marlene. <laughs> I just wanted hi, to Hi Marlene. Hi, hi Beth. Beth and I live in, in under New York State. I live in the village in the town in which she lives. And um, we have actually have a very, very active environmental group in our communities. Before New York State had banned plastic bags, we'd done it in the village of Larchmont. And we've been working on lots of things, but our latest thing is that we have been the first community in the Northeast to have banned gas powered leaf blowers. And uh, if anybody's interested in that, we also have a, a video of the presentation that was made by the health, particularly from the health standpoint, not particularly noise or all the health standpoint uh, and what it does to the earth. And the other thing I wanted to share with you is that we also had organized in our community, something called How Green, how stands for houses of worship. We got all of our houses of worship interested in the, you know, obviously they're all interested in saving our earth. And we've had educational programs, one in each of our houses of worship over the, even during the COVID years. So it's called How Green, and that's another thing we started. Marlene, if you, um, if there's a website for that, I can, you know, I don't communicate even think with there you. Is. I could put you in touch with Lou Doyle, who's really our okay. Sort of person, okay? All right, sure. Thanks a lot. Um, somebody okay. wrote to, in the chat box that they were concerned when I mentioned that we were reduce. I was talking about reducing the amount of waste pickup, um, and I wasn't sure how the how that ended. Let me assure whoever that was that our town administrator is not going to um, eliminate the waste unless and until they are confident that we're going to be able to satisfy the needs of everyone in the community. Um, but, you know, the thinking is that if people separate their food scraps from what goes into the trash, when you segregate that from the recycles, recycled uh, glass and metal and paper, you have virtually nothing left to pick up in the trash. And then economically, you can't justify having just trashed picked up twice a week. So that it's not, a, it's really as if you're compartmentalizing it. And that way, it's a much more efficient way to repurpose, reuse what we use in our daily lives. And that way, we would designate one of those two trash pickup days for food scrap pickup and the other day for trash pickup. But again, uh, you know, we're, we're hyper-focused on how we do this, but if we're able to manage it, and again, we have municipal pickup and I know some communities have private pickup, but this is the road, this is, uh, this is the road to being much more uh, climate friendly because we generate enormous amounts of trash and when we either burn them or put them in landfills, neither are great solutions. So, you know, if we consume less and we can figure out how we can conserve what we do consume, that's the better road. Great. Eileen Riley, you're up. Just unmute, please. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. So uh, Newcastle has a once a week waste pickup. So I should get in touch with you and see how well that's doing. Okay, Eileen, go on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to bring up the point that New York State has a, a, a climate smart initiative. And our county, Putnam County, has signed on to that, as well as two towns in Putnam County. And what that does, it provides a lot of options for the town or the county to, uh, you know, from LED lighting to uh, solar panels um, and things like that. So we have two towns and the whole county working towards this goal. Um, and we also have um, a lot of towns that uh, have a climate uh, initiative, an environmental initiative, just locally within the town working towards these goals. Um, so, you know, Putnam is pretty active in, in working towards these goals. They're really important. Um, and uh, there was one other thing I wanted to say and it just slipped. Oh, well, we also have uh, Second Chance Foods who are collecting food from uh, supermarkets and farms in Putnam County and serving so many people uh, that are food deprived or challenged. Um, and there's a few other things that we're doing here, but we're really busy and that's really important for this uh, county and in particular for the smaller towns. Um, so it's all good. Happy to be here. Thank today. you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? It looks like Deb Peck Kelleher has a has a question. Thanks. I just wanted to mention that what Eileen was talking about is that program that NYSERDA, the New York Energy Research Development Authority runs. It's called um, Smart Climate Communities. And I put the link in the there and it, correct me if I'm wrong, Eileen, they actually have kind of a worksheet for the municipality to go through and yes. a checklist to, um, you know, update their building codes and update their zoning to include re renewable siting. And then if you meet certain things, then the state will give the municipality money for certain projects. So well, it's get, actually- Yeah, you get grants for certain projects if you wanted to put solar in uh, whatever it is that you're working towards. And there is a, a large checklist. And we have a climate smart community uh, group in my town. And there are probably 15 or 20 of them that meet monthly working towards these goals. So we're looking to put in solar uh, for our town to become a solar community, which I'm certainly in support of. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and NYSERDA gives you a lot of help and assistance too, right? Is it NYSERDA? I thought it was coming through the state, but- No, well, they are, it's they're come. a state agency. Maybe yeah. they've partnered, okay, all right. Yep. Yep. And then, well, this all is in keeping with um, the, ninth, the New York State 2019 Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act that Governor Cuomo signed into law that is, you know, looking toward getting 100 percent climate neutrality by 2050. And that's happening incrementally, but it includes energy. And um, and and so, uh, you know, I think to the extent municipalities are signing up as climate smart municipalities, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about this, I think, on Saturday with the Climate Emergency Declaration. Part of the, I think, the goals of what we're doing is to figure out how to get funding so that we can um, achieve these goals, because we can't obviously do them all for, for free, you know. And but I, I apologize. Also my phone, my computer started making all these ringing noises. I apologize. And I muted myself, and now... I wanted to mention also that one of the ways that we as league members can help um, with New York State and fighting climate change in New York State is encouraging our municipalities to have um, appropriate siting zoning for solar farms and wind farms across the state because we are going to have to close down all our gas fired power plants and replace them with wind and solar. Um, so we need to get these things built and they need to be cited. Yeah, our town 
is putting together a critical environmental area so that we can site those locations. We have a lot of mountain ridges here. And as much as I believe in wind power, I really, <laughs> if we could find a better location for it and a farm, an abandoned farm, that would be preferable than using our ridges. Yeah. Well, you know, with with a lot of the uh, new legislation with requirements that are coming in, you've got to be within 25 miles of certain locations, if you will. I know with the Food Recovery Act, the mandates are linked to proximity to uh, composting facilities. So a place like Westchester County, which does not have a lot of open space, has the potential effect of a loophole for large generators of waste if they are not in close proximity to a composting facility. And I, and I think that I saw other laws that had the 25 mile radius. So I think maybe there's something more of an umbrella with that designation, but you know, the devil's in the details in a lot of these bills. So, um, you know, there is a lot of uh, ambitious steps in certain directions. But I think, you know, wherever we live locally, there's this new law I mentioned on food donation. We should also be mindful of the potential that certain uh, waste generators can find a way not to comply. And um, so we'll have to see how all of these laws unfold. And uh, as Kay mentioned, showing up at local meetings, if you see something, uh, mention something, even if it's one sentence, because one of the things that I appreciate um, working on the sustainability collaborative is, you know, our governments are overloaded with things to do. And, uh, for example, it came up at a collaborative meeting the other night that we have a ban in our county on using styrofoam containers. But somebody mentioned that they saw somebody in one of the restaurants using a styrofoam container. And, you know, we, if somebody doesn't voice uh, concern about that, it, it's not going to get enforced. I use that as an example. Uh, there are many. So, you know, as we're all mo moving toward this, we just want to be as vigilant as we can, knowing that we also have to be good neighbors. But we want to shift our social norms so that we can be climate friendly. Could I just say that when it comes to, to enforcement of any of these things, we found in our community that things that we were working on, we, the first thing we did was establish a relationship with the police because they are the enforcement officials in our communities. So we've been working with our police department from the very beginning on all the things we've been working on. And, and that certainly goes a long way, Marlene, right? They, um... You, and you're, you're educating them also, right? You're establishing the relationship and you're making them aware. Absolutely, right from the beginning, particularly, as I say, with respect to this gas powered leaf blowers, you know, that's been a big, that's been our big push lately. I know how hard you all worked on that. Is there, um, there's a link to the law, yeah? Yes, it's on the Larchmont Village, on the front of the Village of Larchmont, on our main web, web page. All right, I could get that link. I can share that for people. I know how hard people in the village worked on it. You know, and with more and more people working from home since COVID, it, you know, it wasn't only the pollution, it was also the noise pollution. In our community, it, actually that started as a noise pollution issue, not so much even as a gas pollution, but obviously, you know, both are, both are an issue that need to be dealt with. Can I see your sure. hand up for Yeah, I just have on? a question for Marlene. If mm -hmm. you, could you elaborate a little bit on how the police uh, plays a role in any, uh, any of these issues? Well, you know, the, the things that we did in our community over the years, main things that I could point to, you know, as I said, we started with plastic bag ban, we have an anti-idling ban, and then finally the gas powered leaf blowers. And the gas powered leaf blowers, as you can imagine, with the landscapers are task was to educate not only the community to different ways of landscaping their own plot of land, but the landscapers themselves and the enforcement piece of it, which people said, you know, most of the communities in Westchester County have some sort of a ban on gas powered leaf blowers in the summer. I don't know about the rest of the state, but it's quite common throughout Westchester. But the police, you know, if it, you, know you hear gas powered leaf blowers all the time, even though there's a ban. And if the police aren't willing to enforce the law, 
mm. you have a big problem. So right from the beginning, we realized that we needed to work with the police. We developed door hangers, which we put on everybody's door and throughout the village, um, saying that this was going to go into effect. We had the police vet what we were doing. Um, we had we got their input. We asked them what we could do to help them. We told them what we needed. And we had some very receptive people. We finally, when we finally actually put it into effect one year, the police got all excited about it. And they had guys going out on their own patrolling it, which was really remarkable to us. Because in the beginning, they'd been very reluctant. But we had really sort of brought them along and they were very um, cooperative. So that's really been a very big piece of the work that we've done. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. I also see a question from Mary Bilby. If you'd unmute yourself, please. Hi, Mary. <laughs> Mary, please unmute. There you go. Okay. Hi, Mary. Uh, I was just going, to say, just going to say that the uh, Albany League has been very active with a local group uh, dealing with zero waste. And we've, we've been very uh, involved in writing grants and the city got a $250,000 grant to encourage people to uh, reduce their waste. And now it's being, it's being used to give people composting uh, facilities, well, yard composters, and also um, community gardens are being set up as a place for people to take their compost. We don't have any uh, municipal pickup of food waste, but with this new uh, law that Beth mentioned about uh, the commercial generators of food waste having to use a commercial facility, uh, what we're finding is that suddenly uh, waste management and the big uh, waste companies are competing for that business. They're saying that they uh, will, will take care of uh, food waste. And what they're proposing, of course, is to have uh, these gas powered or gas uh, anaerobic con digesters. <laughs> That's a mouthful. And we have one small company that's been in business for two or three years now, and they are getting money from uh, the DEC to increase their capacity uh, to buy trucks for picking up the waste and also to uh, have land to do uh, composting, which allows them to create uh, good soil from the food waste. So they're in competition now with the big commercial vendors. And what we, that uh, small organization, uh, Food Scraps 360, <laughs> is one that the zero waste folks have been working with and they, they've been leaders in our group. So if you've got a local uh, company that will do it that way rather than take it to a digester and produce methane or to a farm that has a digester and produces methane, uh, that is preferable. And that's something that, you know, they started very small uh, a recent Union College graduate started it on her own and it's gradually grown. And now um, it's a viable competitor to these big companies. So my question. Mary, you mentioned that you got a $250,000 grant. Was that from DEC? That's right. 
And was this part, was this, um, how long, how long, how long a grant is it? Uh, two years, I believe. It's been going for one year. Uh, one thing we've done is hire a full-time educational uh, person uh, in the city and is working with a not-for-profit organization that's been a, a local garden and uh, soil conservation group, teaching kids how to farm and grow things. And, but they will be involved in teaching people how to do their composting, give them advice along the way. <clears throat> Will this be able to, to sustain itself after the grant uh, is over? Uh, I think that the city now sees the benefit in that they're not taking as much uh, food waste, which is supposedly about 40% of the uh, trash pickup and uh, taking it to the landfill, which is filling out very quickly. We only have a few years of landfill capacity left. So maybe somebody who's dealing with budget can shift money around and right. because it, it, it seems like it's extremely beneficial and should, you know, should go on, not just end when the graph, when the grant ends. Right. It's good to hear your voice. Hi. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for letting us know about that. I don't know whether the DEC so, is going to continue to give these grants. Our grant was not for that amount of money, but it was a three-year grant. And, um, you know, the whole, these grants are time limited in, in the different subject areas. But, um, it, you know, what my experience, at least with Love Your Food, and obviously we had COVID-19 right smack in the middle of it, is that it takes time to grab people's attention. And, um, you know, we're pretty used to doing things the way we do them. Um, and people get their information using different uh, platforms, you know, whether it's the radio, the television, Facebook, Instagram, on and on and on. And trying to figure out when you're working with a municipality, and this grant is through the municipality, we, we have to be careful who posts what, because we're coming from a governmental entity and we want to be able to provide maximum information for people, but it obviously needs to be appropriately messaged. Um, and not everybody looks on Facebook and not everybody checks websites. So, you know, this is a little bit different than what what's Mary is talking about, but these grants are extremely helpful. Um, and then coming over the chat, overcoming the challenges of conveying the information to people within the time frame of the grant and engaging people's participation um, is a challenge. And as I alluded to earlier, uh, the fewer barriers that are presented to people, the better, because the more simple we can make um, a project for somebody to incorporate into their daily living, the more likely we're going to be successful in um, adapting to more climate friendly habits. Yeah, let me just um, describe a, briefly how the composting works in uh, Tompkins County. Um, we don't, uh, there is a central place that we can take composting, but there are places all over town on different days of the week. And so like there's a Wednesday farmer's market three miles from me, I can take it there. Or I can, I can take it to several different places, just a, a bucket. And uh, it's Cayuga compost that does it. And so the night I used to do composting in my backyard, but I can't put food that the animals would get into and bones and things like that in there. But the uh, Cayuga compost can compost it more thoroughly. And then they sell the, the, the soil they produce. So they make money that way by selling bags of the soil and people use that on their gardens. So there's lots of different ways to do it. You know, one thing in our community with the food scrap recycling is that we have a compost give back day once a year. And uh, so the people who have dropped off their food scraps come back in the springtime when they're planting 
uh, with uh, huge buckets and, and they shovel the, um, the compost and they bring it home and put it in their garden. So that's another, another sort of circle of life kind of thing that, um, you know, that we're doing. And people really appreciate it. And, and this is the other thing is that when we, when we burn our trash or send it to landfills, we're taking that out of the life cycle. We're taking it out of nature, if you will. And uh, one of the other things that didn't come up in tonight's conversation, I know that um, Kay was alluding to regenerative farming, but we have, you know, a soil problem because our soil is not as enriched as it needs to be. And so not only do we need to recycle our food scraps because we need to get it out of the trash, but we need to get the nutrients from the recycled food back into compost to enrich our soil. Um, and, and so there are, you know, there are multiple benefits and then we're, you know, we're sinking that into the ground. So it's not atmospheric. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's cooling the climate and it's growing nutritious food. Um, oh, so in the community composting, we can put in anything, well, not anything. We can put in bones, we can put in, um, meat, um, as Kay said, when you do your background, a uh, backyard composting, you cannot, but with the uh, drop off at our municipal, um, facility, it goes to composting facilities that do take the bones. Hello. Anyone else? Well, I just want to say we've been home composting for about 10 years now. Um, and every spring we plant our vegetable gardens and that's the material that we use. Um, mm -hmm. The brown and green, you know, leaves and then grass. We don't really have grass, but weeds and uh, vegetables and uh, our trash out on this road here for our waste hauler is minimal. We have hard, between recycling and uh, we actually return the bottles ourselves to a recycling facility. So we have hardly any trash these days. And you're right, we should call up and say, we only need it once a week. Thank you very much. You know, you bring up a good point about the, um, about your leaves. In our community, we've got a Healthy Yards program and, they, and that exists, you know, around the country. We put a link in for that. But there's a movement, obviously, to, uh, you know, not have the, the leaves picked up by DPW anymore, but to mulch them and to use them in the yard. And so you're not you're not wasting, um, you know, the, the, the sanitation truck and et cetera, and you're replenishing the soil. So we do have a link to uh, the Healthy Yards program in the in the handout and uh, for people who are interested in tips, um, we uh, Kay also suggested um, Cornell Cooperative Extension, which has a lot of great information on that website. So you can check that out um, as well. That's really important because most people are raking their leaves away. We leave our leaves down. We're, we're, we've just now started putting them into the compost. They stay down all winter over the perennials, over the shrubs. Um, they're so beneficial. And as you can see behind me, I live in the woods practically, so I have a lot of leaves. <laughs> it's, a ter it's a terrible fight with the landscapers for mow and mulch. <laughs> Let me tell you, I mean, if you're not in a suburban community, it's a different situation, but we just have, it, it's just a terrible battle. We're right in the midst of that right now, trying to convince people to mow, mulch, mow. Just, it's a hard battle. Yeah. Well, there's so much, um, right, having green lawns is something that um, is a hard battle to get over. Somebody mentioned that there's a cooperative extension office uh, throughout the state. And yeah, we Beth, have we, one. With, Beth, we have another question from Stephanie. Stephanie, unmute yourself, please. Yes, hi. Uh, I just wanted to point out another way to reduce waste, and uh, that's through plastic. There's a number of bills pending in New York State. Right. One that are the New York Plastic Free Act, which would uh, prohibit the sale of and distribution of single use plastics in the state. Uh, and, and it defines the terms, the uh, exceptions for persons with medical conditions, et cetera. It's quite an interesting law. And I think we should take a good look at it. Yeah, for sure. We, I know that, Kay, I don't know whether we had anything around that in the handout, but uh, 
Kay and I were both very involved in, in the whole fracking business and, you know, for companies that are, are doing um, uh, extraction of, um, you know, oil and gas have been creating these um, enterprises around the country where they create plastic because they use fossil fuel to create plastic, you know, which is not great, obviously. Um, and so I don't know, Kay, whether we did have anything in the handout, but thank you for bringing that up because uh, single-use plastic is uh, something we've really got to get away from. Um, one, one thing that I, I also suggest, is, now that people are getting back to restaurants, Oftentimes, people end up with single-use containers coming out of restaurants when they bring home leftovers. And please bring home your leftovers. But what you might consider doing is bringing to the restaurant your own container to bring home your leftovers. And that way, um, the restaurants can save on their single-use and you can reuse um, you know, the container that you bring for your, for your leftovers. What does HC stand for? Somebody put healthcare. Can that person? Hi. Hi. Oh, healthcare. healthcare. Hi there. Plastics and healthcare, such as you mean like um, everything. <laughs> everything they use is plastic. <laughs> well, you know, I you know I wonder around. I mean, think for example with COVID. Um, you know the uh, the vaccinations that we've gotten. Um, what are you going to do for something like that, right? I don't know whether you can recycle that plastic uh, because obviously you can only use it once, you know, for sanitation purposes. Somebody, yeah, plastic straws, right? That is something, you know, that as well. Um, mountains of plastic. Good question. I don't know the answer. Yeah, I mean, um, if anyone can send a link for that new law, please send it and we'll share it, you know, on the um, the, the Plastic Free Act. We have been using... To do that. And one of the things it does, it makes the producers responsible. Oh, yeah, for some reason. Well, some people pop, pop right in. Yes, I have to share that. Who do I send it to? Uh, do you have, if you have the, um, if you have the handout, uh, the REML address is at the bottom. I, I wasn't able to get the handout. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, all right. Um, I have you your can... email, I think. I can send it to you. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Let's see. Barbara? Barbara? Well, yeah. uh, we've been using the stainless steel straws with the silicone ends so you don't ruin your teeth. We've been doing this for years, and they're so easy to clean and use. And also, when I go out, I have a collapsible reusable container you can slip in your purse and so then it expands and you can put your food in it to take it home and so, so is it leak free is it the thing that is it leak free yes so can i'll you go get it well yeah why don't I'll you let's have it. show and tell let's have some show and tell here okay <laughs> well the thing is you know i haven't used it because we haven't eaten in a restaurant for a year and a half so i forgot but i'll go find it all right. See, if you go get the um, like the tum tum chicken or something and they have a little bit of sauce in there, you don't want to get it inside your purse. That's sort of the problem. But I have looked for the right containers, you know, whether they're collapsible, I think um, different materials um, and uh, I can't think silicone. I think so there, there are companies that market silicone um, and we just need them to be leak free. So we've got about another 15 minutes. <laughs> Let's see what we got here. Okay, I'm back. Um, okay, so oh, that's okay. See, All it, right, um, that looks pretty. The top comes off. Yep. And it's both snapped on both places, and then it just. Excellent. Do you I know who it makes is. it? Well, I'm to get my glasses. If you. If you can find out, you can also e send me an email to get some free advertising tonight. That's, gr that's great. Those containers are terrific. You know, my 77-year-old eyes aren't cooperating with me. I'm still kind of, I, I'm still intrigued by that straw that you had. 
how do you clean that straw? What do you do? Well, they give you a brush. Oh. And we've okay. been using them for at least two years awesome. no, or no. longer, three years or something, you know. And right. we haven't, we're not dead. There's no dirt in them. We clean them all the time. <laughs> I've seen the metal ones, but I haven't seen them with the silicone on the top. On Amazon, you'll look around and you'll find. Now, they don't, you can't get the real skinny straws, though, the real, real skinny ones, because there's no silicone tip for them. Okay, and then they'd be hard to clean. But if you, okay, so the other thing now that you mentioned Amazon and, and Kay and I, Kay was talking to me about that with all the packaging, you know, it's ubiquitous. Um, uh, there, there was an email address for Amazon if you wanted to reduce the packaging. I got a link on their website um, for people who want to get minimal packaging, um, but I'm not sure exactly. You'll have to check it out. But I think that um, they do have something in place for people who want to minimize the amount of packaging, uh, which is obviously a real issue right now. And it has been even more so with people getting home deliveries during covid I'm I'm interested if anybody here has um, come up with any changes in personal, um, you know, habits, if you will, during COVID that you, you think uh, you want to stick with. Um, you know, for example, I shop less frequently now. And um, I, I try to figure out about shelf life and all the rest of it. I'm also purchasing groceries from misfit markets that are funny food. You know, it's a little bit imperfect, um, but I'm able to get organic food for less money. Um, I don't know whether I'm going to continue with that. I think I will. But if there are ideas or anything that you've come across this past year that you'd like to share with other people, send me an email because, um, you know, I think there have been some lessons that we've learned out of this past year that um, maybe we can stick with. Um, yeah. So I think, I mean, I would have to say that, that some of it's been the reverse direction for me because like, especially when we were worrying about touching things, you know, before they decided it was less critical, you know, we were using all these vinyl gloves and things like that and uh, getting more things delivered and more ordering more on Amazon. I mean, I didn't do a lot of that, but more than, I mean, I like to buy, first of all, I like to just buy local, but um, I think COVID unfortunately did end up uh, creating habits that weren't good. You know, more shipping and things like that. Yeah. Hey, Beth and Kay, I don't see any additional questions. Kathy, thank you so much for hosting us. I know it's been a really busy week for you. And thank you to everybody who joined us tonight. Hope that we shared some good ideas. I'm so glad for to learn what people are doing. And we'll get the information from the chat boxes from Kathy. And in the next uh, you know week or so, I'll put it all together and we'll recirculate information for folks so that we all have information. If anything comes to you after this evening, um, please feel free to send it to me and I will include it. And uh, if you are a delegate and you're able to um, you know, be at the plenary session, I hope that you will um, support this climate emer emergency resolution. Come on Saturday if you have any questions, but in a nutshell, um, the idea of calling uh, climate change what it is, which is an emergency, uh, has the benefit of um, being a very succinct way to express things to people, engage their activity, and potentially access emergency funding to address the emergency. So hope to see you on Saturday, and thanks again to everybody for joining us tonight. Hey, good night, everybody. Night. Good night.